All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ksenia Piguero, and I will be talking about JavaScript security, as I often do. All right. So what do I do for life? I am a senior research engineer at Synopsys, part of the security research group. And we work on different security things that then go into our tools. And in the last couple of years, or more than that, I was working on JavaScript security and specifically at the security of the frameworks. I was previously a principal consultant at Sigital that got acquired by Synopsys, so has been in the industry for, I don't know, nine years, nine and a half years. Um, I'm also working on my PhD at George Washington University, and this research is actually part of my academic research, what I will be presenting. I also have a two-year-old daughter who's enjoying a children's museum in Amsterdam today, so that's great. <laughs> Very uh, independent. And you can follow me on Twitter where I talk about security stuff. All right. Oh, yeah, and I do like diving. So JavaScript, why JavaScript? I guess I don't need to answer this question to this audience, but it has been the most popular language in the last five years according to the Octaverse report, and it's now not just on the client side, server side, mobile applications, you know, desktop applications, everywhere. And it's now going to be in the IoT software, and we heard the keynote yesterday. That's going to cause a lot of problems. And if we look at the kind of landscape of JavaScript today, what is the most important thing about it is there are a ton of framework, frameworks. And if you look at this quote, this one is from 2012. So <laughs> that is seven years ago. Guess what? Did we stop making frameworks? No, there are even more today. So how many are there? Um, if we look at the client side, uh, according to the JavaScript report, there are over 50 client side frameworks. And some of them are competing. And of course, like the most popular ones are Angular, React, and Vue. Um, some of them are not competing at all. They have different um, purposes. They have different functions. They're used in very different applications, but they exist. Um, on the server side, according to the nodeframework.com, there are about 40 frameworks. Again, some of them have very similar features if we look at Express and Koa and Sales, uh, but the other ones are targeted for very different applications. Uh, then there are some full-stack JavaScript frameworks that do, you know, both client-side and server-side. They're not as popular, uh, like Meteor and Aurelia is a um, knockoff of Meteor. Um, Derby and MinGS, I guess MinGS, we can say it's more popular, a combination of different frameworks that full-stack JavaScript applications. Uh, and now we have JavaScript for desktop applications with Electron and, of course, the mobile platform. So it, they're everywhere. And they're, and they're all frameworks, right? Nobody's writing JavaScript from scratch. So what is there in the frameworks for security? So, of course, we can say if the framework has a, has a vulnerability, you're bringing this third-party code into your application, you're screwed. But... If the framework is secure, if the framework has some security features, does it actually make the JavaScript application more secure? And when we're talking about security in the software development lifecycle, we talk about that we need to shift left, right? Not just doing pen testing, we need to do code reviews, we need to do architecture analysis and try to find bugs as early in the cycle as possible. Well, what is the earliest we can kind of get rid of bugs, is instead of finding them, can we prevent them? And again, the earliest in the cycle, well, can you prevent them as early as possible, maybe at the framework level, right? Maybe before the developer is actually writing the application and making that bug, adding that defect. So the questions that we're posing here are, does the security of the framework make the applications more secure? And does building security controls into the framework actually makes the application more secure, actually affects that? And because, oh, okay, I'll get to that. Um, so a few years ago, that was actually proposed by my ex-colleague, John Stephen. He proposed different levels of mitigations um, for vulnerability in the application. So we start at level zero, no mitigation, the application is vulnerable. Then level one is a custom function. 
right? So developer writes their own crypto, their own crypto function, their own sanitization function, whatever. Uh, level two is an external library. So add a library that somebody else wrote, third party. Level three is a framework plugin. So something that integrates very tightly with the framework. And then level four, something that is built into the framework itself. And naturally, oh, let's look at the example. So as I said, you know, developer function, that's actually from just one of the applications I was reviewing a couple weeks ago. Um, anybody see his problem with the course policy they're trying to add? Right, you allow all origin. So oftentimes we don't trust developers to write their own security functions. So like level one is probably not the best idea. And of course, writing your own crypto, we cannot have a presentation without an XKCD comic. Um, example of level two, an external library like Isapi. Anybody familiar with Isapi? Anybody heard of, you know, rest in peace? Uh, didn't go all so well, but that was a you know good idea of having all the different security features at a third-party library that you just pull into your code and you add your authentication, authorization, sanitization, etc. Uh, level three, a framework plugin, like JavaScript world has plenty of those that integrate tightly into Express or Sales or Happy. Um, and then level four, built-in security, for example, um, Spring Security Framework, right? Where it's just configuration, you add your course policy, you add your cookie flags through the configuration file. So naturally, we would think that the closer the security mitigation is built into the framework, kind of the lefter it is, the better that would be for the application, right? We said, you know, we don't trust developers write their code. Well, the frameworks should do a better job. But because this is academia, we want to see the data. Like, that's what my advisor said. It's a good idea, but does it really happen? So I did a couple of case studies. So one, we took cross-site scripting. Vulnerability. Uh, and of course, common um, mitigations are output encoding, input validation, sanitization. Everybody knows what those are. And I wanted to have an out a set of applications that would likely have a cross-site scripting. I mean, a lot of applications may have a cross-site scripting because somebody screwed up sort of thing, but it kind of, I wanted to have a target group of applications that are very likely to have it. And so the use case that I came up with is when the application actually needs to render the user's HTML. So if it's a blog post, if it's a CMS, if it's some sort of like a marketing tool that needs to send marketing emails, then you enable your users to use, um, you know, bold italics, images, you know, fancy fonts, et cetera, et cetera. And um, how do we implement that? I mean, the easiest way, you just allow users to stick in the raw HTML. A better way to do it, you either sanitize it or you use Markdown and then you transform it into HTML and make sure that HTML is somehow safe. So went on GitHub, found a bunch of applications, um, and because it was targeted to JavaScript, and that was 2016, so that was um, still AngularJS, not Angular, um, and JadePug. So we kind of selected the template engines that were popular at the time. So JadePug, EGS, and Angular applications that were, you know, blogs or CMS, trying to look for full-stack JavaScript applications um, because that issues both, you know, client-side and server-side. Uh, kind of had some filters to make sure that application is not super outdated, has at least one star, um, and, you know, the language is JavaScript, HTML, or CSS, because that's what developers choose on GitHub when they create a project. So we collected uh, 170 applications, roughly a third in each framework. Um, and then if we look at the, well, framework, uh, they're templating engines, right? But I'm kind of using these words interchangeably. So if we look how you can show... Um, rich HTML, rich, rich text in those frameworks. Uh, in JadePug, uh, by default, it escapes everything. So if you have, you know, h1 equals title, it's going to escape, um, it's going to output and code HTML. And then if you want to use interpolation, you have to say, you know, not equals, and then it doesn't have any protection, but it just will render HTML as is. 
EGS does kind of the same thing. By default, it escapes everything, but you can turn off the escaping or enable interpolation with the percent angle bracket dash. Uh, and then there is no sanitization. And then if you take AngularJS, of course, it has contextually aware escaping. So by default, it, by default it does uh, output encoding, but you can also ask it to uh, output raw HTML with the um, ng-bind HTML against AngularJS. I know this is all ancient. <laughs> And you can also enable the raw interpolation with, without sanitization by saying trust as HTML. Right. So those were the things that we were looking in applications. How many of them are outputting HTML in unsafe measure, uh, manner? So this is the, research, the analysis pipeline that you know downloaded the projects. Actually, downloaded only the template files so that it was easier and lighter and then use different parsers for the t three different templates, um, kind of based on the out, uh, outsourced, uh, open source parser. So I had the, um, updated the pug lexer and pug parser for the pug framework, used the core EGS um, library to kind of with some updates to parse what I needed, and then I used ESLint for um, AngularJS with my custom rules. So ran those tools, found the issues, did my manual analysis because as we know about linters, you know, they're not always true. So for example, there would be cases where um, that HTML is output in an unsanitized manner, but that HTML doesn't actually come from the user, right? Because there's no data flow here. Maybe it's, um, you know, just comes from the stored file. So in this case we say, okay, it's, it's trusted. It's not an issue. And then perform statistical analysis to kind of verify the results. So what did we get? So for Jade, EGS, and AngularJS, 38% um, of the Jade Puck applications were vulnerable, 43% uh, of EGS, and only 12% of Angular, AngularJS applications were vulnerable. Looks great. I mean, it kind of con goes with what we expected. So the Jade, Puck, and EGS don't have any sanitization built into the frameworks, Moreover, they don't even have a third-part library that will do it for them, right? So in this case, the mitigation level was either level one, developer has to do their own stuff, or level two, they could use a third-party library. Um, the most common approach that we've seen that they use is uh, just using a markdown, which doesn't actually protect you from HTML. <laughs> I mean, th there are corner cases, it's not 100%, um, but that was something. Uh, and then Angular has the mitigation built in. So that kind of confirms our hypothesis. But then the question that you know, my advisor asked, well, maybe the Angular developers are just better. How do you know? Right? Maybe they're more experienced. They're, the applications are bigger than this is open source. It's on GitHub. Who knows what these applications are? Right? So I had to run the confounding variable analysis, so statistical analysis, that basically t takes other factors that could have impacted those results. And the other factors that I could get from GitHub was um, overall developer's experience, which was a, a proxy for that was the number of projects in this developer's repo, right? Overall developer's experience in JavaScript, number of projects in JavaScript for that developer. Uh, the project size, kind of the project, um, project size kind of proxy for their maturity of the project potentially. Uh, project popularity, how many stars, project reuse, how many forks, so kind of how mature, how solid the project is. And then the last one was the template engine that they were using. And so in confounding a uh, variable analysis, you kind of run those tests, and the result that you get, if that number, the p-value, is less than 0 0.05, that means that factor actually affects the results. So with that, the only factor that actually affected the results was the template engine. So all the other factors were pretty much equal. The quality, quality of developers was pretty much equal. So that proves the hypothesis. Like, all right, makes sense. The better, if, if the mitigation is implemented in the framework, it's great. The applications are more secure. Well, let's try it on a different set of applications. We only took JavaScript. Um, I'm sorry, we only took cross-site scripting. We only took front end. So for the second study, I took cross-site request forgery. And of course, looked at the server-side frameworks because that's where the mitigation is going to be. 
The reason for cross-site request forgery, um, this vulnerability is interesting because it basically went away from a WASP top 10 in the kind of through the last seven years, right? So it looks like as an industry, not specifically in JavaScript, right, but overall, we are getting rid of this vulnerability, and that is attributed mostly to the fact that it's built into the frameworks. Um, like .NET and Java, a lot of frameworks have that built and it's going away. So there are different types of protection for cross-site request forgery. The vulnerability depends on the authentication uh, being made through the cookies, right? So if the site has, if the site doesn't have cookies, there is no CSRF. We have to remember that. And the common mitigations are, of course, the hidden tokens either in the body or the double submit cookie or two-factor authentication, kind of less common, but like for, for, for certain functionalities. And then there are some client-side um, um, mitigations as well, same-side cookies, which are not used kind of across all browsers yet, but they exist. And there were a couple other mitigations that were proposed in the academia world, like whitelisting the expected origins, so you know, only trust if request comes from expected origins, or um, have a allowed referral lists, but that's just the academic um, recommendations, right? Like that hasn't been really successfully implemented. And then, as I said, there are a couple different cases where if your application is using JWTs and is not using session cookies, then it may not be vulnerable to cross-site scripting, right? Using JWT, uh, I'm sorry, not cross-site scripting, uh, cross-site request forgery. Using JWTs for session management is a separate <laughs> question. I don't recommend that, but it's a kind of a, a topic for a, a separate talk. Um, and then if the application, for example, doesn't use HTTP, but has all the communication through the WebSockets, again, WebSockets don't have cookies, therefore no CSRF. So data selection, again, we need to have a set of applications that are likely to have a CSRF. And you know, one, they must have some sort of state changing functionality. So post request that changes the state. And so not just, you know, a read, a get application that only gives data. So it has to have account accounts, user accounts, and has to have to store some data that is sensitive enough, right? Also, if it changes something that you don't care about, maybe there is CSRF, but it's really not a security issue because you just don't care about it. So we chose applications, again, like blogs that would have users, CMSs, e-commerce, of course, are kind of the biggest um, the risk for e-commerce websites if somebody goes and places an order instead of you. Uh, some REST APIs. Uh, in terms of the frameworks, again, we chose kind of the most popular ones, and that was 2018, Express, Koa, Happy, Sales. And I also added Meteor because it was just interesting because it was a full-stack JavaScript framework. It's not as popular as, as those four, um, but you'll see why. And the target was to have about 100 applications per framework. We were not able to reach our target for every application because, for example, Happy uh, turned out to be not as popular on GitHub. And in those specific kind of types of applications, we weren't able, just they just don't exist there. <laughs> so we got about 100 for the other ones, and there were fewer for Happy. But overall, had 364 applications. Um, so how do we prevent CSRF in those frameworks? Um, the first three, Express, Co, and Happy, have plugins that are built in kind of that are built for the framework, very tight integration. And it's pretty straightforward, right? You require the plugin and then you configure the plugin with the settings. Um, same for Hap, um, for happy, you know, slightly different, but yes, you still require the plugin. You configure, you plug it kind of into the framework slightly differently, but same, same idea. And then the sales framework is a uh, configuration driven framework. A lot of things are done, are enabled through configuration and sales. And it, it was built with security in mind and they kind of, um, sold that, right? Uh, the, that part. Um, so they basically have a configuration that you can just set true or false, uh, or you can set configure 
um, more specific details of how you configure the C surf. Like here, an example. For example, you can if, um, configure it for AJAX and restrict the origins, uh, etc. And then the Meteor framework actually uses WebSockets for communication. So that kind of didn't fit into our um, taxonomy of where the mitigation can be implemented. Because what Meteor does, it uses its own uh, protocol, the distributed data protocol, DDP, and when the server, the client connects to the server, at first they communicate over HTTP, but then once the session is established, they drop into the WebSocket level, into the TLS, and they keep that connection and communicate through that. So there is no cookie, so you cannot actually uh, exploit cross-site request forgery with that. I mean, you could exploit that there are some attacks for exploiting that initialization, this, the initialization of the connection, the first step, and basically establishing a connection instead of with the server, establishing a connection from the client to a malicious site. But that's kind of a different story. It's still not cross-site request forgery. Uh, and once the WebSocket is open, you know, from your browser in one tab to the server, if you have another tab with a malicious application, it cannot get into that connection. Um, so that was kind of out of the question. So all the applications from Meteor are by default fixed, right, for, for cross-site request forgery. And then the JWTs, as I said, because they are using tokens that are sent in the headers, they're not cookies, they're not attached by default by the browser. If you are sending a request from the same browser, from a different tab to the same server, the browser wouldn't automatically attach the JWT tokens. So CSERF is not possible. Um, yes, there are other protections or the other limitations with that. So as I said, Meteor kind of doesn't fit into that taxonomy of the levels. So I had to add another level, level five, and kind of called it architecture level mitigation control. So the, miti the mitigation control is built into the architecture of the framework or the platform. And if we think about other examples in software development world, you would say, okay, buffer overflows was very popular, you know, they exist in C, they don't exist in Java in general, right? Why? Because Java manages memory for you. So that's exactly that example where a security control is kind of built into the framework, uh, not even the framework, into the platform, into the architecture, uh, and it's kind of eliminated for these set of applications. So same hypothesis, let's see if we can prove it for CSRF. Kind of similar pipeline. The only difference is how I checked for CSRF. Uh, used linters, well, linter, you know, ESLint rules for all the different frameworks that I had. I had to write, you know, separate rules. And um, yeah, and, and there are different. So I, in the previous slides, I showed like one CSRF mitigation li um, library that does CSRF mitigation per framework, but um, because it's open source, there are multiple different libraries for some frameworks. Some are more popular than others, but I had rules for, you know, to catch as, as many as I could. Usually there are two or three. It's not like there are 15 different libraries. So what did we get? Um, basically, out of, for example, for Express, out of 109 applications, only six were protected. So that's a very, very, very small number. Uh, for COA, out of 100, only six were protected. For Happy, zero were protected. And then for Sales, seven were protected. Uh, but then I looked at how many of them are using JWTs, because if they do use JWTs, I cannot say that they are vulnerable to CSRF. And those numbers were higher. Uh, I don't think that they were because developers wanted to protect the applications from CSRF. <laughs> they probably just wanted to use JWTs for very different reasons. Um, so there were higher numbers, and then I combined those to make sure I could count like, wait, only the number of applications that are protected and not protected by both methods. Um, and you can see that for COA, for example, I had six with the plugins protection, 14 with JWT protection, and the total is 19 because one application had both. <laughs> and that definitely shows like, okay, well, they're using JWTs, but they don't even know that the JWTs are protecting them from CSRF, so they just added a plugin just in case. Uh, and so if we look at the percentage of protected applications, 
and compare them to the mitigation levels for the plug, you know, the plugin level or the framework level mitigations. The numbers don't tell the same story as for cross-site scripting, right? We have 14%, 19%, 33%, 35% for L3 protection, and then 14% for L4 protection. So here kind of doesn't matter where the, where the fix is in, in the application, right? It doesn't look like that makes applications more secure. So let's run the confounding variables analysis just in case. Kind of did the same tests, make sure that all the developers have similar skills, right? Not ones are better than others. And again, no surprises here. The data didn't show any single factor that will actually affect the results. Because, I mean, the results didn't have any correlation to start with. Um, so the framework also did kind of, in this case, didn't make any, any change, any, any influence on the result. So for CSRF, the hypothesis doesn't prove. Um, that's interesting, right? So why? So if we compare the results, and when I was talking about CSRF, I was talking about the number of protected applications. So then here I had to flip um, that and talk about the number of, um, oh, sorry, I flipped the uh, JavaScript, right, and talk about the number of protected applications again. So if we look in the JavaScript, Comparing the two, if the mitigation is at, you know, level one or level two, fewer applications are protected. If the mitigation is at level four, more applications are protected. In CSRF, that doesn't kind of end up. And the only difference is that, okay, if it's at level five, obviously, if it's fixed at the platform level, then it's all good. So what, why, right? What's the difference? And the difference was that for JavaScript, the L4, level four protection in the framework was enabled by default. And for, I'm sorry, for cross-site scripting. And then for CSRF, even though sales talks about being very secure and having all the security features built into the framework, they were not enabled by default. So a lot of applications had the CSRF set to false and nobody went and changed it to true, even though it was a, you know, one flip, right? You didn't need to do anything else, just change the setting from true to false. So the secure defaults kind of matter, right? Um, what can we take from, from this? Well, if you are a developer, a framework, uh, a framework developer or maintainer, right? Build securities, build security controls into the framework, but also remember about the security of the defaults and enable those defaults as much as possible. If you are not a framework developer, if you are a regular developer, um, you know, oftentimes we say, okay, choose the framework that has the most security features. Like, remember, not just about performance or features, remember about security. But now I would add to that, build controls into your process, be that your CI, CD, your code review, anything, that checks what are the security default that your developers are using, right? If that framework has that features, we'll check if you are using those features. Um, and the last part is, well, again, if you are a framework developer, if there is any, any way to build that control into the architecture of the framework, that would be the best. But of course, that is probably wishful thinking for a lot of um, vulnerabilities, but that will definitely fix the issues. And with that, I think we have time for questions. If you want to ask a question, I've got a microphone, which I will give to you. So is there any question? Yeah? Uh, is there a plan to do a similar kind of thing with uh, React, Vue, and Angular? I haven't thought about doing that. So, I mean, adding React to the React view and Angular. It, so if, if I did kind of cross-site scripting again, right, it, it would be, well, one is like, why do I need to do cross-site scripting again? I already have the results <laughs> from, from the academic standpoint, right? Um, but their protections, they all have protections that are built into the, into the frameworks, right? So they are the same level. I don't think, I don't expect them to have different results. So they're probably not as interesting for cross-site scripting. Um, but that's pretty much it that what you can do in the client side 
applications. So, yeah, thank, thank you. you. I mean, I would love to continue that for other languages, so not just JavaScript, right? And look at other languages and other frameworks. That would be interesting. Uh, just in terms of looking at the hypothesis of whether like the left shift um, with the security features is is beneficial or not. Um, in the first example, the uh, XSS, um, you were comparing sort of level one, level two to level four, which is obviously quite a big distinction. Whereas in the in the request forgery one, um, you were kind of comparing level three to level four. I guess it's harder to look for level one or two for that specific vulnerability. But kind of if you've not got the framework default turned on by default. That's almost like including or not including a plugin. So I said the boundary is very similar. Is that would you agree with that? Or yeah, I, yeah, that's that's a good point. If if the control is built into the framework, but it's not enabled by default, how different is it from just adding a plugin? I yeah, it's it's very close. That that's that's a good observation. And I mean, I wish I could compare you know four different frameworks that would have. You know, level one mitigation, level two, level three, level four, but kind of the idea is also not to game the system, right? Not to choose the specific framework. So the goal was to choose, okay, what are the most popular today for that task? What are the most? And I guess the question will be answered with, you know, doing more research and having more samples for maybe other vulnerabilities in other languages, and then this data will come up. But yeah, that's a good observation. Thank you. Do you think those conclusions would uh, would extend to commercial applications as well? Because you were looking just at, at the open source ones, so the developer skills may vary and so on. I would say probably. I mean, I don't have the data. I don't have access to a bunch of commercial applications. Um, but being in the business of developing SaaS tools, oftentimes that's the best proxy we have. It's GitHub, and that's how we make our decisions. So... I mean, I would love to run this on commercial applications if somebody <laughs> will let me do that, right? Um, but I mean, I see your point that the um, skills level of the developer is probably higher. Again, we can we can make this assumption. Um, a lot of projects on GitHub are just I don't know somebody's testing something out, students doing their things, right? Like you know, you, you, again, you, I don't have that specific data. Um, but I would I would expect the numbers in general to be higher, but probably the correlation will still be the same. Because it will depend, again, on did somebody check? Like, do If, if in the industry, in the, in the enterprise, you have the control of, like, go and check those default settings, then the numbers would be higher. Um, but I don't know. So my, my professional experience would be against what you just said. I, I I don't think that commercial development is of a better quality than open source one. You don't think uh, it's better quality? No. Good. <laughs> that's why that's why open source is a good proxy for that. So like, okay, maybe a little bit better, but yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Also, maybe I don't know. Maybe it depends on the industry, right? If you take financial industry versus gaming industry versus healthcare, I, that would be you know a very interesting research to do. <laughs> Are you looking to extend your case studies? So you just did XSS and CSERF. Are there any other particular issues that are on the roadmap for your academic research? Thank you. That's kind of the question that I hear from my advisor. <laughs> You're like, this is not enough. Um, I want to look at electron applications. I want to look at desktop applications and see what kind of vulnerabilities are common and what kind of mitigations are common. Unfortunately, well, I mean, we'll, we'll see because in desktop, there's only one framework. I mean, that was the new one, I think, was the other one, but that didn't gain much popularity. So, I mean, I definitely want to continue that. So, thank you. Any other questions? One more? Or... Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks.